The Democratic majority in the House is on its way out. But in its two years, this Congress has done quite a bit. A pandemic rescue package, a massive infrastructure package, a health tax and climate law. And things are not quieting down, even in this lame duck session. The House will soon take up its version of a Senate bill protecting same-sex and interracial marriage. And then there's a looming deadline to keep the government open, funded. And then there is the matter of that looming rail strike. Even for those who lost their elections and won't be returning in January, the work is not done yet. Joining me now, one of those outgoing Democrats, New York freshman Congressman Mondaire Jones, who lost his primary after being forced out of his own district by a fellow Democrat, who then lost that race. We'll talk about that in a moment. Congressman, welcome back to the show. The House voted today to impose that union deal and separately in favor of seven days of paid sick leave for rail workers. Why can't rail companies making billions in profits afford to pay people sick leave? Are we in the 21st century or the 19th one? We're in the 21st century, thank God. And that means that we know rail companies can't afford to do this. We know that rail companies have made record-breaking profits this year alone, and certainly it did very well for themselves last year. And they can afford to do seven days of paid sick leave for their workers. It's not going to break the bank for them, and it's what dignity requires. Yeah, it's what dignity requires, but our American system, our economy, uh, often requires depriving workers of dignity. Here's what's interesting. You have a president, Joe Biden, leader of your party, who claims to be the train guy. He claims to be the labor guy, the union guy. Will his administration and Congress imposing a deal without paid sick leave against the will of unions representing a majority of rail workers, will that end up being a black mark on his legacy as a pro-labor president? Well, look, there's been a lot of conversation around this, right? We know that eight of the 12 unions uh, were perfectly fine with the negotiated agreement that Secretary of Labor uh, Marty Walsh was part of. But we also know that there were some deficiencies with that agreement. Uh, and it's why four of those 12 unions did not ratify that agreement. That's why we're pushing for this. I understand that the White House is nervous about what objectively will be devastating consequences if this agreement is not enacted. Uh, but we've got to balance that and, of course, can make sure that we do both of these things, that we avoid a strike and damage to the economy uh, by making sure that we, while at the same time uh, in ensuring that our employees, working people, get basic things like paid sick leave, th those things are not mutually yeah. exclusive. And it's what dignity As requires. Ever. As ever, Congressman, I find myself frustrated with the messaging out of your party. You have Secretary Buttigieg and others saying very loudly that we cannot afford a devastating strike, which, as you say, is true. We can't afford to have a devastating strike that causes, you know, all sorts of economic repercussions. But the solution to that is to ask train operators to give paid sick leave to their employees, not to ask employees to give up their demand for paid sick leave. I agree completely. Um, I wish that it had been done sooner than this. Uh, obviously, you know, there is a, a disagreement among various people on what was actually discussed when this agreement was being negotiated. But it's hard to believe that anything could have been struck that didn't include something as basic as paid sick leave. Th this is something that in America, too many people still don't have. But many other yeah. folks just take for granted. Right. I mean, the idea, especially in a COVID environment. So true where you could easily get sick from COVID or, or we're in the flu season and anything else, that you wouldn't have these sort of basic aspects of an employment agreement uh, is really baffling to me in the year 2022 going into 2023. It's baffling to me as an immigrant to this country who comes from another Western country where all this stuff is taken for granted and legally guaranteed. And it amazes me how many Americans still don't realize what an outlier this country is when it comes to basic stuff like paid sick leave, paid time off work, paid vacation. To read that quote in the post did my head in this week. Use your vacation uh, to go see a doctor. Ridiculous. Um, sticking with democratic messaging and my frustrations with it, in your term in Congress as a freshman, you spent a lot of time pushing for Supreme Court expansion, for Supreme Court reform, a big issue which Democrats have kind of dropped the ball on a while ago and never really have prioritized in the way that Republicans have. Even now, your fellow Democrats haven't really gotten on board with Supreme Court reform, certainly not with expansion. Uh, the administration has run a mile from it. And yet you have Justice Samuel Alito accused of leaking a decision and no signs of any top Democrats calling for hearings or investigations into Alito, let alone into Clarence Thomas, 
who keeps ruling on Trump and election cases, even though his wife tried to overturn the election for Trump. Democrats are AWOL on this. You know, it is wild to me that The New York Times decided to drop its blockbuster expose uh, detailing credible allegations against Justice Sam Alito uh, that he leaked the authorship and outcome of the Hobby Lobby opinion from 2014 to right-wing donors. Uh, and, that, and that that article was dropped on a Saturday uh, and, frankly, still has not given the kind of, gotten the kind of attention exactly. that it is a real crisis. And, frankly, the crisis preexisted our knowledge of this particular incident. Uh, you know, how many decisions depriving us of fundamental rights that we had just taken for granted in this country are required before a number of my colleagues feel an urgency to do something about it that will be meaningful? Uh, in the case of my bill with, with Jerry Nadler and Hank Johnson, adding four seats to the Supreme Court, but also per a bill that I also share with those individuals, enforcing or creating enforceable criteria when it comes to recusing yourself from cases that you have no business presiding over, uh, which is something that, uh, you know, Justice Thomas should not be doing the case of, uh, of matters relating to January 6th, given the activism, the far right activism of his wife, Jenny Thomas. Uh, and we also know that there is no binding code of ethics uh, with respect to the yeah. Supreme Court, which is something that I think was shock most Americans. So we've got crises on all fronts, both as a matter of ethics and then as a matter of substance, because you've got far-right partisan hacks comprising the 6-3 supermajority that was, frankly, unethically obtained when you look at what Mitch McConnell did over the past several years in depriving yes. the elected President Obama from appointing Merrick Garland, for example, to the high court. On that basis, would you call this Supreme Court an illegitimate court? Look, I, there are a lot of names that can be appended to, to this court. Certainly, the conservative majority has been operating in illegitimate ways when you look at uh, its complete uh, abdication of responsibility in terms of its own precedence, uh, when it changes its rationales uh, to suit uh, partisan outcomes that you know, they want to achieve without going through the rigorous analysis that they want everyone to believe that they're actually undertaking when they decide these cases. Uh, certainly, yeah. the way that the court had a vacancy for 14 months to simply deprive President Obama of, of, of getting his nominee confirmed, even a hearing was not given to Merrick Garland, who, of course, now is the attorney general. I, and, and I think you, would much prefer him on the Supreme Court than as attorney general of the United States. Uh, yes. <laughs> that, would have, that would have worked out much better in many ways. Earlier this year, Congressman, the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Sean Patrick Maloney, decided to run in your seat, the 17th District in New York, forcing you to run and lose elsewhere in New York in the Democratic Congressional primaries. He then lost that seat in the midterms, becoming the first DCCC head for 30 years to lose their seat. What did he do wrong? And do you think you could have won that seat if he just left you alone in that district? Well, as you know, Manny, redistricting has been a nightmare in New York State. Uh, and there's plenty of blame to go around, not just with respect to the, the outgoing DCCC chair. Uh, but of course, I would have won my seat. I represent 70 percent of it as of now. And it's a district that knows me, that loves me, a district, frankly, whose constituents are devastated. Uh, by what happened in redistricting. Uh, and it's a district that, you know, really wants to see someone like me represent it. And when I was not on the ballot, I think a lot of folks stayed home. I know a bunch of Democrats who simply could not bring themselves to vote uh, for the Democratic nominee because of their perception of what happened to me in the race, uh, and so on and so forth. But here's the thing. Uh, 2024 is a very important moment for this country when it comes to saving our democracy. There's going to be a presidential election. There are going to be opportunities to take back the House. Uh, it's difficult to imagine doing that without flipping the seat that I currently hold, a district that Biden carried by 10 points. Uh, and so I'm not ruling out anything with respect to 2024. What I will be doing in the meantime is working in the way that I've already been doing to show leadership on issues, frankly, that I would like to see more members of my party show, uh, whether it is with respect to the Supreme Court or the economy or racial injustice and LGBTQ rights, which will face uh, assaults like what we have not seen recently, unfortunately, due yeah. to the 
in the Supreme Court and what Justice Thomas foreshadowed for us in his concurring opinion in the Dobbs matter just a few months ago. This Supreme Court is on a rampage, and only Democrats in Congress are committed to codifying basic rights by law in order to protect abortion, in order to protect other fundamental rights. We're going to need to take back the House majority in 2024. So the person who's going to have to take that back, the new leader, is Hakeem Jeffries. On Wednesday morning, Congressman Jeffries was elected leader of the Democrats in the House. He's the first black man to lead a party in Congress. And he's a New Yorker, but he's also known for berating progressives. You're a black man, a New Yorker, and a progressive. So what do you make of leader Jeffries? Is he the right man for the job? As someone who has made history in his own right, I understand the importance of representation, and I commend uh, the, my, the new minority leader on his historic achievement. And of course, I take special pride in the fact that he's from the great state of New York, um, which is not perfect, but I think, think it's still the, the, the greatest state in the union. Um, look, uh, it remains to be seen in a Congress that will have more progressives than ever before uh, what his leadership style will be, how he'll get along with this ideologically diverse caucus. Um, whether he will mentor and create space for some of the younger, newer members who have, uh, you know, great passion uh, and at times will disagree, I think, with certain approaches that he takes. And, and, and so that's, that's, that's an, a, an open question. And, and I look forward to seeing, you know, him hopefully rise to the occasion and, and be the leader um, that I think is possible for him to be. And one last question, Congressman. You're leaving the House in January, having been elected as one of the first two openly gay black men in Congress. And one of the last bills you'll be voting on in the House, possibly as soon as next week, is the Respect for Marriage Act, which provides federal protections for same-sex and interracial marriages, passed in the Senate on Tuesday. How landmark a piece of legislation is that, in your view? It would be huge, Mehdi. I mean, it was just a few years ago that the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, and unfortunately, due to the far-right activism of this 6-3 supermajority, we can expect over the next several years for the court to reverse its own precedents, whether it is with respect to marriage equality uh, or the ability of employers to discriminate on the basis of sex and gender in the workplace, and so on and so forth. So what we're doing with this bill is protecting both uh, marriage equality and, yes, interracial marriage, which may well be on the chopping block as well. Who would imagine that we would be uh, still litigating these issues in the year 2022? That is, that is what the yeah. Republican Party has wrought. Um, I will say I, this. I will say this. The Respect for Marriage Act, and I'm proud to have, have co-authored it with Jerry Nadler, it, uh, it still would leave about a dozen states in this country uh, as places where the federal government is not in the position of respecting the marriages performed in those states because they cannot be performed in those states. There are about a dozen states or so that still do not allow for marriage equality. And so we still have work to do even after we pass this legislation as historic and as important and as life-changing as it will be next week.